It's a riotous and colourful ceremony in Northern England, a Pakistani Muslim wedding. The nerves are on show from the groom, Usman, as tradition collides with the new. As is custom, bride-to-be Nagina sits in a separate room and Imam Irfan Shisti asks three times if she's marrying of her own free will. I have to ask you, under no force, under no pressure, do you, Medina Tariq, daughter of Tariq Masul Sam, do you grant me your express permission to... No pressure, despite mum and dad sitting alongside and a phalanx of cameras hired to capture every precious moment. Marriage as a pact between freely consenting and equal partners is something most would take for granted in 21st century Britain. And yet, as the ceremony unfolds, Imam Shisti stresses the point about women's rights. That if the lady, if the bride, if the woman, if the wife, if she says no, then it ain't happening. If she'd have turned around and said to me, I'm not happy for this wedding to take place, then it doesn't matter how much has been spent on this afternoon, it doesn't matter what thousands or millions have been spent, that consent of hers is the most important thing. The wedding of Usman and Nagina certainly gives every appearance of a happy, mutually agreed union. For many young British women in the country's Asian and Middle Eastern communities, that's not the case. Partners are preordained by parents, a code of behaviour enforced, and if daughters step out of line, consequences can be severe. There are probably between eight to 10,000 forced marriages or threats of forced marriage in the UK every year. Uh, we prosecuted more than 200 cases last year of honour-based violence. What we have here are crimes in, uh, in the name of the father, the son, and the blessed male members of the family. I think people who, who do these actions know categorically that what they are doing is religiously wrong. There isn't a misunderstanding of the faith. What there is is, is, is just themselves trying to justify their actions through the faith. Perhaps we need to speak out more about it. Violent crime resulting from the honour codes of ethnic communities is a major problem. British authorities acknowledge they don't know the true scale of it. We have kidnappings, abductions, uh, assaults, um, sexual offences. <sighs> you know, anything that you could imagine uh, could happen, does happen in the name of honour. The most extreme examples are homicide, and we have perhaps 10 to 12 of those in the United Kingdom um, every year, which are honour-related. These young British women were murdered in a perverse attempt to restore family honour. <music> 27-year-old Surjit Atwal killed on the orders of her mother-in-law. 20-year-old Banaz Mahmood raped and strangled on the orders of her father and uncle. And 17-year-old Shafilia Ahmed, suffocated by her parents. Shafilia had rejected her parents' choice of a Pakistani Muslim husband. She wanted to be a lawyer and to make her own choices. Her parents decided she was shaming the family, beat her frequently and finally forced a plastic bag down her throat. Her siblings were made to watch as a warning to them. Family honour was paramount. When Shafilia's body was found in a river, her parents put on tearful displays, feigning innocence and outrage. Years later, one of Shafilia's sisters smashed the parents' conspiracy by giving evidence against them and they were sentenced to long jail terms. Shafilia's repeated pleas for help were ignored. Even a suicide attempt failed to convince police she was in desperate trouble. She couldn't be any clearer. 
and they failed her. And that is the story of many of our victims here in Britain today. There are many Shafili Ahmeds out there. When somebody is murdered, for example, and we've seen horrific murders here in Britain, Shafili Ahmed was one, there was a silence in that community. Where was the outcry of people standing up and speaking out and saying, this is wrong, nobody is doing this in the name of Islam. You know, we need to go out there and preach in our communities not to do this to your children. That doesn't exist. Who is being silent? Who is being silent? Who is being silent? The people within our communities that are being silent are um, those who commit these crimes, those who don't commit these crimes. So good people are turning a blind eye. Our, our so-called community leaders, so they exist in the form of a religious leader, a community leader, a counsellor, a politician. Um, they're the people. And the ones who are breaking the silence are the victims themselves. Organisations like us. We're the ones breaking the silence, but we do that at a cost. Lithuania, Pakistan, Portuguese, Portuguese. India, English. Yeah. Definitely English. <laughs> Saturday night in Leeds, one of the biggest cities with a significant Asian population. Teenagers flock to the city square, having fun. Many Asian girls don't enjoy these freedoms. Some would even be barred from attending an event as benign as the annual light show, restricted in what they can wear, whom they can talk to, where they can go. These teenagers born here in Britain have a life whereby the only place they have independence and free, the right to think freely is in school. As soon as they go home and the front door is closed, it's as if they're living in some rural part of Pakistan or India, even though they're living in Britain. More than four million people in England identify as Asian, almost 8% of the population, predominantly from South Asia, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. In a recent survey of 500 young British people from Asian backgrounds, two-thirds said families should live according to the concept of honour. Almost one in five said physical punishment of women was justified by certain behaviours, such as going out at night unaccompanied, dressing a certain way, or wanting to marry a man deemed unacceptable. And 6% of the young men surveyed said under certain circumstances, Honour killings could be justified. Changing deeply entrenched attitudes and practices that subjugate women is not proving easy. And so law enforcement agencies are developing more sophisticated approaches, starting with professionals who understand what drives honour crimes. At the moment, uh, in so many communities and so many families, it's merely used to suppress women, to oppress women. They are the only ones that carry the honour on their families. So if they are perceived to have misbehaved in some way or made their own choices, then they have dishonoured the family. Uh, if men do the same, uh, well, it's men. You know, they can do what they like. And um, as I said, honour can be good and a force for good. Regrettably, uh, it's been used too often to control women. Nazir Afzal is the chief prosecutor in England's northwest. He's a Muslim who makes a very clear distinction between cultural practices and crime. Sharon, I was going to ask about next week. Forced marriage is one of the last forms of slavery in the world. You can imagine total and utter despair. Uh, so many of our victims of forced marriage will harm themselves, uh, will actually uh, kill themselves. Um, and that's because that's the only way they can see out of this. From the law courts to the police beat, there's a growing realisation that some Asian families and communities have been using their culture as a shield to justify the notion that family honour can be regained by violence. That concept exists in every Asiatic mind, whether they be in Great Britain, whether they be um, in Switzerland, whether they be in Pakistan, India, wherever. It's a concept. It doesn't stop just because you um, cross a border. What do you 
Detective Constable Palbinder Singh is a Sikh who's helped crack some difficult honour crime cases. I've always advocated to ignore cultural sensitivity. It's a ruse. We won't interfere in that family. It's their culture. Well, hang on a minute. Crimes are being committed. People's lives are being destroyed. People's freedoms are being suppressed. Oh, but that's okay. That's their culture. Well, have you actually spoken to the people who have been denied these basic freedoms? And that's, what, that's the problem with this um, concept of diversity. It's now crossing over into political correctness and it's simply not working. There is this mistaken perception that, you know, it's culturally acceptable um, for forced marriage to happen. Um, and police officers, along with many other professionals, have been scared to address that issue, which is why um, we really need to, to change that mindset and, and, and that moral blindness. How much does a fear of being called racist play into it? Um, I think it, it, it can play a big part. No, no police officer or, or any other agency wants to be branded racist, but that's something we've absolutely got to get past because we just have a clear duty to protect the victim and to safeguard them. So what we usually do... Detective Sergeant Trudy Runham of the West Midlands Police has worked with many victims of honour-based violence and tries to educate other officers. What we do know is that the rate um, of Asian females, their suicide rate, is three times higher than anybody else. Um, that has been said to compare only to um, soldiers, suicide rate coming back from Afghanistan, which obviously they're coming back from a war zone. So what does that tell you about how these um, females in this case are feeling? And self-harm um, is absolutely an, a key indicator of these issues. It was the horrific killing of Banaz Mahmood that catapulted honour crime into public consciousness in Britain and exposed the failings of police. On the fourth occasion, she takes a list and she names the people that are going to kill her. At the top of there is her father, her uncle, other male members of the family. She said, these are the people that are going to kill me. If anything happens to me, these are the people who did it. Banaz Mahmood was a young Muslim woman from an Iraqi Kurd background. She told police her family was planning to kill her because she'd left an abusive arranged marriage and was seen kissing a man outside a tube station. Months later, lying in a hospital emergency room, she explained how her father had tried to kill her. And she was still not believed. She was dealt with as being melodramatic, Fantasizing. Jasvinda Sanghera knows the horrors of honour violence. She knows that Banaz Mahmood should have been saved and she needs these trainee detectives to know where police went wrong. Would you believe her? As a professional, the response was, surely not. You're not going to be killed for being seen kissing a boy. Just a month later, the 20-year-old was dead. She'd been raped garroted, her body packed in a suitcase. Her uncle and father were convicted of ordering the killing. Banaz's sister, Bekal, gave evidence against them. All I can say is devilish. That's all I can say. It's nothing good. How can somebody think that kind of thing and actually do it to your own flesh and blood? Jasvinda Sanghera has a strong sense of the suffering of Banaz and other victims because she narrowly escaped a forced marriage and now campaigns against it. She was the sixth of seven daughters, plus a much favoured son, raised in a close-knit Sikh community. This is the house that I grew up in and yeah, this is the wall me and my sisters used to sit on. My dad would be standing at the fence having his crafty cigarettes. Today, looking at the house, I see nothing but pain, in honesty. It's really an empty shell for me now. Jasvinda Sanghera describes a claustrophobic upbringing where girls lived by strict rules or were claimed to bring shame on their family. One by one, she saw her older sisters married off at about 14 or 15 years of age. I watched at least three of my sisters being taken out of school 
and then being taken abroad to marry a stranger, they'd disappear. They'd come back as somebody's wife their parents changed, they'd wear a wedding ring on their finger, and, and nobody was seeing this as abnormal, it was just a normality. When her sisters complained of beatings by their husbands, her mother would insist their duty was to stay in the marriages. Then, one day after school, 14-year-old Jasvinda was shown a photo of the man her parents declared she would marry. And then she told me that I was promised to him from the age of eight. And I just looked at her, not taking it seriously. I took an overdose and my, one of my sisters said, if you think you're going to get out of it that way, you've got another thing coming. Everywhere I turned, they were just sending me back in and I felt isolated, suicidal. I felt completely trapped. The bedroom there with the window slightly ajar is the room where my family locked me in the room there when I said I wouldn't marry the person. They took me out of school and I was held a prisoner in that room for a long time. How long for? Uh, I can't remember the exact time, it was a number of weeks, but I remember planning my own escape. When she eventually did run away, her mother said Jasvinda was dead to her. It's a little place, packed rooms are so busy. Mm. But that is definitely a gossip shop. <laughs> Jasvinda now runs a charity called Karma Nirvana that tries to prevent honour crimes and supports victims. On a tour through her old neighbourhood, she worries about girls suffering at the hands of their families, just like she did. She wants schools to be more alert to the signs, in particular, unexplained absences. If you are Asian and missing from education, the same questions are not asked as the white counterparts here in Britain. And that has not changed because we know there are hundreds going missing off our school rolls. Maybe they're not being forced into imagination, but the point is, ask the question and look into it. They're not even doing that. What's been recorded as truancy may well be punishment by parents or being sent overseas to be married much earlier than the legal age in Britain. In 2008, the British government reviewed school records to see how many pupils had gone missing. They discovered hundreds, hundreds of young girls, um, and by that I mean 11, 12, 13 year olds who would just disappear off school rolls. The prosecutor says no one knows how many of those girls were taken from their country. Imagine the fear. You're a British born and bred schoolgirl and as you enter the airport you know you're being sent to marry a man you've never met in a different country. Or maybe you don't know. Many girls think they're going on an exciting family trip only to discover the truth later. Many girls go on school holidays and simply never return. What about those ones who do suspect? What can they do here, their last chance to avoid a life not of their own choosing? An insight and understanding of how the important roles of airports uh, will play to assist a victim of a forced marriage. Police uh, and security are being trained to spot young women who may be in trouble. Jasvinder Sangera's son-in-law, Anup Menota, represents the charity Karma Nirvana. His message is that alert officers can save lives and that sometimes passengers will take desperate measures. So as a last resort, we always say the spoon in the knickers technique if you have that suspicion and you don't want to go and you have that doubt. Uh, okay, would you like to tell me a bit more about your situation? The idea of hiding a metal object to trigger security alarms was suggested by a counsellor at the Karma Nirvana helpline, advising a desperate young woman on her way to a forced marriage overseas. Okay, is the perpetrator um, present in the house while you're speaking now, in the same room? So the call handler said, put a spoon in your knickers, which when you go through security, it will go off. And at that point, you're going to be stopped by um, a security guard and say, I'm being forced to marry, and did you which is exactly what she did. And it saved her life. Um, we can look for refuge accommodation for you, which is a place of safety for you to go. One of the volunteers um, is Sal, a vision impaired Muslim university student. Her desire to leave home for student accommodation led to yeah. harassment and rejection by some yeah. members of her family. 
Okay, no problem. I'll ring you back, Naz. All right, thank you. Bye. It's seen as dishonourable, a girl wanting to um, do, a girl wanting to do these things, a girl wanting to gain this independence is, is seen as dishonourable um, in Asian families. I mean, I don't think what I've done is dishonourable. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm proud of my roots. I am proud of being Pakistani and I'm proud of my religion. What I'm not proud of is the way that people kind of manipulate culture and religion uh, and kind of, and, you know, as a result of that sort of, on a base violence occurs. Sal says that despite abuse and forced marriages, many girls choose to stay with their families. Losing your family is really, really difficult. It's not, you know, even though I might be in touch with sort of distant members of my family and, and you know, a lot of them, losing that immediate family is really hard. It's really difficult to, to, to cope with. But one senior Sikh figure says while a huge problem exists, it's not in his community. It, it is just a misunderstanding of who Sikhs are. Um, Veteran journalist Indijit Singh was appointed to the House of Lords two years ago, a measure of the importance of the Sikh community. He insists honour-based abuse is not a major issue for his community. There is no honour code. I don't know, this is all jargon that is uh, borrowed. Jasvinda Sanghera is a prominent campaigner with a Sikh background and she tells the story of she what she... She has made a career out of saying these things. Are you saying that what she's saying is not, did uh, not happen? I, you need to get a full picture, you need to look at the wider picture. If she looks at her own family background and then um, expands from there, that is wrong. That does seem to contradict accounts we've had from people within the Sikh community that there is a problem. So those sort of things occur. I, I wouldn't uh, dismiss them for a moment, but I, it is the exaggerating. The British government is so alarmed by the frequency of violence that it plans to criminalise forced marriages like Australia did earlier this year. And the Foreign Office has a special forced marriage unit which attempts to track down British citizens taken overseas. And there's another significant problem. Some Asian officers subscribe to the traditional honour codes. Now, I'm not saying they can't properly investigate, I'm saying they don't wish to investigate it they may have the same ideological view as a suspect family. What about you as a Sikh? Are you feeling divorced from your community? I think it would be fair to say I was divorced from my community, using your words. Um, my community, um, and when I mean my community, I'm talking about the community leaders, because they're the drivers. They don't wish for me to speak publicly on these and other issues on which I do so frequently. They are from a generation that's completely different from mine. They have come from um, an Indian subcontinent and there's a vast gulf separating the two. When's your next scan, Natasha? I haven't got any more now. Are you going to put this in there now? Not yet. I'll put it in the blender. Yeah. Today, honour crime campaigner Jasvinda Sanghera enjoys life on her own terms as a mother of three. Her eldest daughter Natasha is a lawyer and expecting a child. I remember that Natasha in the morning, remember in the, um, in the hotel room? Oh, look at your face and his anticipation, look at his worried there. face, what he's thinking, <gasps> is she going to turn up? Natasha married for love, in a ceremony blending the old and the new. Jasvinda needed to learn from scratch about the Sikh customs, never having had her own traditional wedding.
It was a bittersweet day. No one was there from Jasvinder's family. Running away to avoid a forced marriage caused a deep rift. 30 years on, most of Jasvinder's remaining relatives still shun her. And I think that had she not have made that choice, then a lot of the other things that, well, the life that we've all lived, me and my, my brother and my sister, would not be the same. I probably wouldn't have been able to study in the same way that I did. I wouldn't have had made the same career choices that I did. How do you feel about your mum and everything she's gone through? Immensely proud. I don't think I could be prouder of my mum. Um, and we, we're we just like, you know, best friends, really. And I think it's because of my mum's experiences. For many British Asian women, there will be no fairy tale wedding. The notion of family honour will continue to dictate whom they marry and when and even where the marriage will take place. Not a happy ending. Well, let's have three cheers for the bride and groom. Hip, hip! Thank you. Thank you.